have. If you have just a blanket policy, you might have coverage for it. And it turned out they didn't know they had it, but they did. And so they were covered for it. Things like that happen a lot. Now, there's also a big difference between wanting to have something, asking God for something, and not knowing if you have it as well, isn't there? In other words, um, the Bible says, and we'll see this in a bit, the Bible says that he that believeth hath the witness in himself. That's 1 John. We're going to be there in 1 John 5 later on this morning. He that believeth hath the witness in himself. There are times when a believer knows he's saved. I mean, you just know because the, this, the witness is talking to you, speaking to you. But the Bible also talks about the person of the Holy Spirit of God in reference to how we behave toward Him. He's a person, you know, God, the third person of God, the God, the Holy Spirit. And if you grieve the Holy Spirit of God, my friend, you won't know He's there. Oh, you may, it may be like when you have said something terrible to someone that you love or done something terrible to someone you love and you, you know Him, but you won't, He won't be saying anything. He'll be grieved. If you quench the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, if you quench the Spirit of God, you won't hear from Him. He won't be talking to you. He won't be saying, hey, I'm quenched over here. That's why you can't hear me. It's because I'm quenched. You know, you didn't listen to me and you threw, threw water on me and, and you bruised me and you harmed me. And, uh, you know, He'll be silent. Third statement this morning, lack of assurance comes from the silence or quenching of the Holy Spirit. The lack of assurance in the life of a believer comes from quenching or silencing the Holy Spirit. You say, I don't feel saved. Well, because the witness isn't speaking in you. Okay, now, in John chapter 3, I want to look at a verse uh, right before Jesus explains simply how a person gets born again. He uses the illustration of the wind to illustrate being born again. In verse... 8, Jesus said in John 3, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Now, I used to think that what this meant, to say that the wind bloweth whither it listeth, and thou uh, canst not tell whence it cometh, or whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. And Luke actually put that chair away like I asked him to. Uh, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. I used to think that what it meant was, that, the, and it does mean this, was that the Spirit of God is invisible, right? You can't see Him, God the Holy Spirit. He's in the world. He's not just limited to us, but He lives in us. That is, we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. John 3, uh, I'm mean, sorry, 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 3. We're the temple of, of the Holy Ghost. And so I used to think that when the Scripture said, that a person uh, who is saved, you can't tell it. What that meant is the Spirit of God is invisible and you can't see it. But actually, I think it's more akin to this. The Bible says that the wind blows where it listeth. And I've asked people before, can you see the wind? No. Well, some people immediately answer yes because they're thinking of this. See those leaves? They're, they're moving a little bit. Why are they moving? Because the air is blowing, right? It's the wind. So the wind is it's artificially blowing. We've made it blow. We've even uh, given it a trajectory, the direction that it ought to blow. See those? That's not just because I'm shaky. There's something going on there beyond what I'm doing. I actually am not shaky this morning, am I? Anthony, you should have made me coffee. Uh, <laughs> uh, see, the, the wind's blowing. Whether it okay, now here's the deal. <coughs> The Spirit of God moves things. Or should I say the Spirit of God moves people? I've said this dozens of times, and there could be nothing that I mean uh, more sincerely. I am not a religious person, and I have zero tolerance and use for religion. I hate religion. I hate religious people. I'm serious. Now, I don't hate people, but religious people, I hate them. I just hate that. It's just... People that go around trying to convince people that they're good because of a piety that they portray. There's nothing more irritating than that to me. A person that tries to think 
that uh, his person is acceptable because of what he does. That's religion. And I don't have any use for that at all. And I did not darken the doors of a church house if the Spirit of God didn't live in me. And that's a fact. In other words, what moved me to come here this morning is God's Spirit. Now, I'm not saying this morning I had an epiphany. You know, when I woke up at 5 a.m., as I did this morning, anticipating it's Sunday, I'm ready to go to church. I had to wait this morning to go to church. And when I woke up at 5 a.m. and wanted to go to church, it wasn't the first time in my life that it occurred to me that God is real, that the Bible is real, and that the Spirit of God prompted me to want to worship. In other words, that got settled a long time ago. And on mornings when I'm too tired to feel like waking up, it still moves me. Because the Spirit of God lives in me. You understand that? In other words, I go door to door visiting, soul winning, on Tuesday nights as often as I possibly can. The reason why is because I'm convinced that God's Spirit wants me to. And when I go, it is not because I'm religious or I'm trying to earn some kind of eternal brownie points. It's because I believe that, that uh, because of God's moved in me, he's, he's done a work in me because of what I believe. In other words, the Spirit of God moves me. When I say something and it's too harsh or it's wrong or it's unkind or it's uncalled for and I get convicted about it and I apologize to someone for it, it's because the Spirit of God moves me. When I preach the Word of God, and it literally thrills me to have the opportunity to proclaim it to the lost, and when uh, I get to give the Gospel to somebody, I see someone get saved, and I get a feeling that's unrivaled by any other feeling when somebody comes to faith in Jesus Christ, my friend, it's because the Spirit of God moves me. Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, a person could imitate the work of the Spirit, and they know they're just faking it. But the Spirit of God does move people who He lives in. Can I say this to you? And I hope it helps you with your assurance of your salvation. There's a reason you're here this morning. There's a reason you're here today. There's a reason, there's a reason you're in a church house trying to worship God when a lot of people are trying to stamp out the knowledge of God in their hearts. There's a reason you've responded the way you have. You say, Pastor, if you knew... How wicked I actually am. Well, I have a little bit of a notion of it. I think you're terrible. But the reality of it is that nobody even smiles. They're just all like, really doesn't. <laughs> the reality of it is that God's Spirit is moving you. And that ought to help you when you understand the verses that we're going to look over here uh, beginning now. So in verse. Three, in verse 8 of chapter 3, The wind bloweth where it listeth, thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Jesus told Nicodemus, Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, unless you've had spiritual birth, you'll go to hell. You're a religious man, you're a Pharisee, you're a ruler of the Jews, you are accepted as godly, God-fearing, as religious by all your peers, they've even made you a ruler of them because of how much you've convinced them. But unless you get born again, you can't enter the kingdom of God. So the gospel is that you must be born again. That's the gospel. Uh, Nicodemus asked the question in verse uh, 9. He said, how can these things be? Now he is not saying, how can this be true? You know that God... Uh, gave language to man. I'm stay overstating some things for simplification, but I want you to think of this, okay? God gave us language. The first man, God made him able to speak and to communicate. Man doesn't know language and how to use it better than God does. As a matter of fact, language declines. Language does not get more specific or better. And God made grammar the way that we understand the things that are said and know the context of those things and know the range of limitation of words in grammar is because God gave us language. So let me just say this. If Jesus intended to say, or if the Holy Spirit of God intended for John to write, Nicodemus questioned, how can this be true? If that's what the statement means, it could be phrased that way, right? Right? But it isn't what Nicodemus said. He said, how can 
these things be? Or how can this be? In other words, in verse 9, he said, how can these things be? And what he meant was, how does a guy get born again then? How does a guy get the Spirit of God living in him then? And Jesus uh, ultimately said this. He illustrated to him, no man knows, only God knows. That's verses 11 through 13. In verse 14, he said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, a man cannot lift up the Son of Man. Jesus was lifted up on the cross, just like in the wilderness when Moses lifted up the serpent, and anyone who was bitten by a deadly viper, if they looked at the serpent, lived, and anyone who didn't look, didn't live. Jesus said that whosoever believeth in me, and the one who's lifted up, the Son of Man, should not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, so the gospel is believe in Jesus. The gospel, listen to me, the gospel is believe in Jesus. Now you say, well, pastor, but that word believe, that word believe, what does it mean? Does it mean uh, be fully confident that you believe? Does it mean try to believe? What does the word believe mean? Well, it's pretty simple. It means act on your faith. It's a word that has an action to it. And it is to... Trust in what you know or trust in what you say you believe. Okay. <laughs> this chair could have been doctored by somebody. I'm a chair breaker, to be quite honest with you. If you have me to your house, you better give me a chair. If you have me sit down at your home, I'm just warning you. You better give me a chair that doesn't have any structural issues because if it does, I laugh or something and fall on the ground. I don't know how many times. Right? There's a family I used to... Uh, go to their house every Sunday and do military ministry. I don't know how many chairs in their house. And they used to just laugh until they cried every time I broke one of their chairs. I think they set me up every time. I, I was telling a story in chapel one time about a guy that fell out of his seat during chapel because he fell asleep. And he was on the very front row. And that was back when they when they had the, what the, uh, the auditorium seated, I think, about 3,500, the Dale Horton Auditorium. And something like that. And so everybody was watching this guy. He's on the very front row. The chapel speaker's up here waxing elephants. And, and nobody's paying attention to him. Everybody, I mean literally, everybody noticed. It just got quiet. Everybody noticed. Everybody's looking at this guy who's asleep. And he is like fading fast. And he's just, you know, like this. And he just started to slip forward. And slip forward and slip forward. And everybody is just holding their breath. I mean, you can hear an auditorium hold its breath when it's got thousands of people in it. And he's just like this and like this. And you guessed it, he fell right on the ground. Wham. And no chapel speaker could have held anyone's attention at the moment that happened. Do you remember this, Lee? Do you remember the chapel service the guy fell out? Well, you probably video chapel that day or something. Uh, this is... This is one of the best things ever. The guy just hit, he hit the deck and everybody's watching him. And he was going to, he just fell right on the ground while the preacher, you know, it's like there's nothing worse than putting somebody to sleep so badly they fall out of their chair, right? So he might as well just ended his message there because nobody listened. He didn't even know what happened. So he's trying to just speak to a bunch of people that are, in, you know, rip roaring and laughing. Yeah, thousands of them. It was a real mess. Yeah, so I was telling about it that week at these people's house. I was talking about the guy that fell asleep. I said he leaned forward like this. And I leaned forward and my chair just... <clears throat> it was like it was made out of Legos or something. And every one of them blew apart or Lincoln Logs. And it fell and I hit the ground. And they started laughing. And then after I got married, I took my wife to meet this family. And I sat in a chair and it broke. And I think I, I must have broken two or three chairs in their home. What a mess. Uh, it's one of those things. It's not. It happens in our home as well, in other places. So that's why we bought these chairs that are Dodge Ram rated. They, uh, and uh, you can put each wheel of my pickup. We should do it sometime. I've got a Dodge Ram. We could put my truck on out in the parking lot and put the four wheels on the four chairs and make sure that it's really that they really can hold a Dodge Ram. So anyway, <laughs> supposedly that's what they were tested with. So okay, if I believe that chair will hold me up. 
I'll sit in it, right? In other words, I'll just take a seat. Um, now, the reality of it is that until I've actually sat in it, my belief doesn't really count for anything at all, actually. Right? In other words, I can say, yeah, I mean, as Dodge Ram rated, I believe it. You say, Pastor, have a seat. I say, I think I'll just stand. What do you believe that chair will hold you? Yeah, I do. Would you sit in it, please? I could sit in it. No, would you sit in it? Well, I believe it'll hold me. Well, then sit in it. Well, now, if you believe it, then you will act on your faith, right? Okay, now, faith requires an action. Believing requires an action. What's the action? Asking Jesus, Asking Jesus to save you. Okay, this is how it worked in the, in the wilderness. In, in the wilderness, when people were bitten by the poisonous viper, the Bible says if they looked, they were healed. Were they healed before or after they looked? After. after, right? Before they were healed, believing did nothing more than guide them into looking to the serpent. Intellectually, you and I know there's nothing about a, a, a brass snake on a stick that can heal someone. We know that intellectually. But we know that God could heal somebody who does what He says. And God said, look at the serpent and you'll live. And a couple of thousand years, several thousand years before Jesus came, God used an illustration of faith. And Jesus tied the whole thing together when He said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, the Gospel is believe in Jesus. How do you believe in Jesus? Look to Him. Whereas you can say you believe in, in that the serpent will heal you, but if you don't look, you'll die. How much do you have to believe to look to a serpent? Enough to turn your head. That's how much. I promise you, until they were healed, nobody had pure, perfect faith. In other words, their faith was a desire that they acted on. And believing in Jesus, my friend, is a desire that you act upon. That is, you want to be saved and you ask Jesus to save you. Now let me ask you a simple question. You want to be saved? When you prayed to be saved, did you want God to save you? Did you want Jesus to be your Savior? My friend, that's a desire acted upon. That's the Gospel. That's the Gospel. Now there are a lot of people that take verses of the Scripture that are talking about discipleship or talking about a repentance in the context of believers. They take words and they take context and then they throw them into the gospel, make them requirements for eternal life. The requirement for eternal life is to act, to act upon believing in Jesus, to turn to Him, to look to Him. My friend, if it were any more complicated than that, hear me now because I'm about to insult you and you don't want to miss it. If it were any more complicated than that, you couldn't be saved because you are not capable enough and you're not intelligent enough. Do you hear me? Serious. If the things that people try to make necessary in order to believe are really necessary, you are not capable enough and you are not intelligent enough. And I don't mean I don't mean that to be kind, I mean it to be unkind. <laughs> you hear me this morning? I, I'm a nice guy, but I just I just want you to know a person who's arrogant enough to think that they're safe because of how much they believed or how knowledgeable they were that when they believed they definitely don't think that the riches of God are unsearchable the way the Bible says. You'll never come to an end of things you come to understand about God. But salvation isn't developing a complete dissertation on the Godhead. Salvation isn't about achieving requirements necessary for God to acknowledge your belief. Salvation is simply about believing in Jesus, my friend. And that's it. That's it. You'll never have assurance if you don't believe the gospel. You'll never have insurance if you add to the gospel. And so that's why we say the first step in assurance of salvation is to know what the gospel is. Okay, so let's deal with some more things. John chapter 17. Uh, if you'll please go there. John chapter 17. I'd like to look at it. This is one of the most personally moving and meaningful passages in the world to me. So when I get to pick a topic, and I'm not just expositing, 
then I'm just going to figure out a way of using it in my message this morning. So if you don't understand how this fits with our message this morning, it's just because I like this passage of Scripture and I want to read it. Okay, that's not really true. It has a purpose. But I'll be honest with you, I get emotional about John 17. This is just one of those passages of Scriptures that touches me in a personal way because John chapter 17 is Jesus after He's explained to His disciples that He's going to the cross and now he's preparing actually for going to the cross. He's at that moment. And he prays to God. And he specifically prays for his disciples. But in John 17, he also prays specifically for me. I'm actually referenced. I'm actually prayed for by the Lord Jesus himself in John chapter 17. So I really internalize this passage of Scripture. It's very, very personal to me. And again, it's one of those ones that just touches me and moves me. Because it gives me a little bit of a feeling of how much I'm loved by a God who I don't deserve to be loved by, but I actually am. It's just one of those, it's just like, wow, I'm loved. Passage of Scripture. If you need to feel loved, read John 17 sometime. Okay, now here we go. In verse 12, well, let's read, start in verse 9. This is the verse I was talking about. I pray for them. He's speaking of his disciples. He said, I pray for them. I pray not for the world but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be as one as we are. So specifically what Jesus asked God for is about his disciples and about those who believe. Jesus is talking about how the world hated him and they're going to be hated. And he's asking God to protect them because they're hated by the world and they don't belong to the world. So I'm not praying for the lost, I'm praying for the believers here. And he said, I've kept them while I was in the world, but they're yours. You gave them to me. And he, of course, mentions uh, Judas in verse 12. When I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. And those that thou gavest me, I've kept. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, let me ask you a question. Was Judas ever saved? No. No, he wasn't. Did Judas know he was never saved? Yes. He certainly did. He was very, very clear. Judas didn't think he was a devout, genuine disciple. He was a pretender the entire time and knew that he did not believe in Jesus. And Jesus knew that Judas wasn't saved and references it here before the betrayal ever takes place. He says, I've kept all but one of them, the one that's a son of perdition. He's lost, but he was never given to me. He was never mine to keep. Now let me ask you a question. Who is it that does the keeping? Who kept the disciples? God. Who? God. Yeah, Jesus did, right? Okay. <laughs> Do you understand from John chapter 17 that keeping you or keeping you saved is God's responsibility and not yours? Listen to me this morning. You need to understand this. The struggle with assurance is not about you. It's actually about God. In other words, when we say, I don't know if I'm saved, and we would qualify that by saying, I want to be. I've asked God to save me but I don't know if he did. You're not maligning your character. You're maligning God's. In other words, what you're actually saying is, I don't know if God can save me. Some people actually say it that way, but most don't. What you're actually saying is, I don't know if God can do what he promised. Or I don't know if God did what he promised. Jesus said, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But I don't know if that's true. If you don't know if that's true, whose character is being questioned? I always ask the person who questions their salvation, did you ask God to save you? Did you want God to save you? Then who's the liar? Are you saying God said He would, but He won't? Do you, un do you understand the accusation in the struggle for assurance? The struggle for assurance actually isn't about us, it's about God. See, a lot of times we... Okay, let me, let me qualify that, let me say it better. The struggle for assurance, if you understand the gospel, is not about us, it's about God. In other words, it's about God's doing what He said and His ability to do what He said. It is not about uh, whether or not we really believed or we really whatever. 
or the struggle for assurance it is an admission that you think that works are necessary for salvation. If you say, well, I asked God to save me, but I don't know if He did, and then you say, but it's not God's fault, it's because I don't know if I meant it. You heard this? I don't know if I meant it. I mean, and, the, and by the way, the person who didn't know if they meant it, how many times do they try to mean it? I know people that for years, every single night when they go to bed, beg God to save them. God, I really want to be saved. God, I really want to be your child. God, if, if I didn't mean it when I said it last time, would you please save me now? I, I mean it. I want to be saved. And then they'll sin or they'll do something that undermines their assurance. And all of a sudden they'll wonder, did God really save me? Did I really mean it? If I really meant it, why, why do I sin anymore? And then we'll take 2 Corinthians 5.17 out of context and say, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I'm supposed to be a new creature. And we don't give any credit to the work that God's done in us, to the desire that we have or the conviction that we have for sin, which a believer doesn't have, or an unbeliever doesn't have, I should say. We don't, pay it, we don't think about that. We don't think about the fact that we want to live for Jesus and, and uh, we demonstrate actually some fruit. We just think about where our failures and again, that goes back to what? It goes back to thinking the gospel is about what you do instead of what Jesus does. You cannot have assurance of your salvation unless you have a clarity on what the gospel is. You cannot know that you're saved unless you know that the gospel is believing in Jesus, the work of the cross. I'm a sinner. Jesus died for my sin. I've asked God to give me the free gift of eternal life because of what Jesus did. And I'm saved because of what Jesus did because I believed in Him. Okay, uh, let's go back to John chapter 5 and verse 24. Let's kind of hammer this out. We're almost out of time. This is too bad. Did I say 1 John? I, I meant to say John. John 5, 24. We'll be in 1 John 5. But John chapter 5 and verse 24. I just want to read of this verse, and I would like you to put your name into the... Uh, he that. So just put your name. I'm going to read my name into it so you can see what I'm talking about. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ryan Price, that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life. Because that's me. I heard the word, and I believed. Okay? And the Bible says, hath everlasting life. That's present tense. And then the Bible, and then we see future tense. And shall not come into condemnation, but is past. I'm not going to pass. I have passed from death unto life. Okay? So if you've believed in Jesus, you heard God's Word, you believed in Jesus, the Bible says you have, you already have eternal life, and you shall not, that is, you will not, your future is not coming into condemnation, but you have passed from death unto life. Uh, I want to read verse 18 of John chapter 3 briefly. He that believeth on Him is not condemned. Present tense. You are presently not condemned if you believe in Jesus. This is John 3. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Get it? A person that believes is not condemned. A person who doesn't believe is already condemned. What do you have to do in order to be condemned? Nothing. Just remain in unbelief. What do you have to do to not be condemned? Believe. Verse 36 of John 3. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Now, friend, you don't have to be a rocket surgeon or a brain scientist in order to understand this. All you have to understand is that the present tense here and the word everlasting used together have a great meaning. Everlasting means how long? Forever, right? And a person who believes already has everlasting life. And here's a doctrinal truth that's pretty neat. I don't know when it first occurred to me, but the realization that I'm never going to die. Like that, I, I, I'm not going to begin when, when I, if I physically die, if my body dies, that's not when eternal life starts for me. Eternal life began for me the moment I'm saved. I'm never going to die. I'm never going to be separated from God. I'll never see death. I will never be separated from God, ever. Oh, I may put off this body and put on a temporary body until God resurrects this physical one. But spiritually speaking, there's no such thing as death. I am 
uh, my separation from God has been repaired and it's forever settled in heaven. It's forever sealed. I have everlasting life. My friend, the very concept of everlasting teaches us assurance. The very concept of everlasting, if the word everlasting means everlasting, then it's Jesus that keeps you saved and it's forever that He keeps you saved. If you think that you can lose your salvation, you've got to go to your Bible and you've got to scratch out every place the Bible talks about eternal and everlasting life because the two concepts do not work together. That's a direct contradiction. You say, Pastor, that's oversimplification. No, my friend, overcomplication is where you lose your assurance. If you understand the basics, then understanding the word everlasting teaches assurance of salvation. Uh, we're beyond time today, so let me just read some verses to you. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1 is talking about assurance. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now, if you never paid attention in grammar class, it would behoove you, it would be worthwhile just to go back and learn the tenses. Present tense. Whoso believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. If you believe Jesus is the Christ, you are saved. You will not be saved. You are saved. It is not a future event. It's not a past event that didn't continue. It's a present standing. You're born again. And everyone that loveth him that begat also loveth him that's begotten of him. Okay, in verse 9, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness which God, of God which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. So I just go ahead and put my name in there because I have Ryan Matthew Price believeth on the Son of God and hath the witness in himself. This isn't me in the next one, so I don't put my name in that one. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Not me, man. I'm not going to... I'm not going to call God a liar. I'm not going to reject Jesus. He that, because he believeth not the record that God gave his Son. Here's the record. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. How do we get eternal life? Do we deserve it? Do we earn it? Do we work for it? Do we ask for it? And then it's our responsibility to keep it? No, my friend, we get it by receiving it. God gives it to us. What does it mean to be given something? Being given something has nothing to do with earning or, or any kind of merit, does it at all? Okay, so this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. Do you know what that word eternal means? It means forever. What kind of life does God give when He gives life? Off and on, for a while, but you lost it? No. Who keeps it? Who keeps us saved? Jesus does. Who gives us salvation? God does. How do we get it? By asking for it. And God does the work of it. My friend, your assurance of your salvation is not... Or I mean, sorry, I did say your assurance. Your salvation is not dependent on you. Your salvation is dependent on God. That's the record. Now, one last verse. But pastor, what if I believe all that, but I still don't feel saved sometimes, or I don't have assurance of my salvation? Because sometimes we do feel saved, don't we? When you're living right, you're loving the brethren, I mean, you're feeling it. I mean, it's just, and there's nothing better than that, is there? Than feeling saved. I mean, I love God, God loves me, I'm living right, and my life's good, and I'm feeling it. It's good to feel it. And here in John, 1 John chapter 3, verses 18-24, through 24, we'll, we'll end with. And I want to explain to you why a person doesn't feel saved. Uh, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Okay, so don't love by what you say, but love by what you do. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. Whoa, 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 whoa. Is, what's that word? Assure? How do we have assurance of salvation? Hereby know we that we are of the truth. Hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. How's a person feel saved? By doing more than talking by living, by being what you're supposed to be. Listen, if you don't live right, you won't feel right. Assurance is a feeling. And you won't have it if you don't, if you don't live right. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knoweth all things. 
Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have we confidence toward God. What is assurance? What's well, confidence? If you don't have confidence, it isn't because God condemns you, it's because you condemn you. Where does your lack of assurance come from? From God or from you? Where do your doubts come from? From God or from you? They come from you. Why? Because you know the truth about what you're doing. And if you're loving in word and in and in uh, in and in uh, tongue, you're not loving in deed and in truth. You don't live right with, with other you don't treat other Christians right, you don't love people, you don't sacrifice for people, you don't give yourself to others, you won't feel saved. You don't live for Jesus and you have sin in your life and you're not you're not acting right, you won't feel saved. Now God's greater than our hearts. In other words, our salvation is not dependent on that feeling. But you're not gonna feel you're not gonna feel right. If you can't trust yourself, you can't trust others, right? Your lack of trust is projected actually toward God and toward what the gospel is or your definition of the gospel. But actually your lack of trust is a is a personal issue. Okay, now I don't I'm not trying to condemn anybody or be unkind about this, but the lack of assurance is a personal issue. That is, God's got it handled. When you ask to be saved, God delivered on His promise, and His Word says that you're saved. But if you don't have assurance and confidence, then the diagnostic is that it's because you're loving in word and in tongue, but not in deed and in truth. So you got to live like you got to live right, and you got to act right, and you got to be right inside. Well, you know, I do everything so people think. No, you got to be right. I can't have that thought. I can't entertain secret sin. David said, "If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me." So my prayers aren't going to be answered. I'm not going to be helped. You got to you got to be honest about what's going on, and you got to get right about what's internal. So a lack of assurance is an internal issue. It has nothing to do with the reality of whether or not God has saved you, whether or not you're actually born again. It has to do with how you feel. Assurance is a feeling. It, it's, it's along with confidence. There you can do things that you're not confident about. It doesn't mean that you can't do it. You ever followed instructions and you thought you did everything right, and but you're <laughs> waiting until you plug it in? You put something together and you thought you did it right, but you might have crossed a couple wires, you're just not sure about it. How do you know? How do you know when it's right? Well, you plug it in and it works. Well, listen, you can be all right, but if you're not plugged in and working, you won't have assurance. James said it this way. He said, show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show me thee my faith by my works. He said, faith without works is dead. Didn't say it's non-existent. He said it's dead, it's inactive. It doesn't do anything. The struggle for assurance is, is the reality that what we believe we're not actually practicing. And that's not on God, my friend. That's on us. Father, thank you for what we've learned this morning. And I pray that you would increase the knowledge and truth in our hearts and help us, our Lord, as we try to finish out this lesson next time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I want to uh, cover our topic that uh, Joel mentioned, but unfortunately there's too much material. I, I thought I'd get further than I did today, but I hope it was a help for you. If you have any questions about assurance, please feel free to ask them as well. What's your question? Is um, easy believerism, is that an appropriate term? I know they use it to like mock. Yeah, to kind I, of... I like the word hard believism as a concept, you know, as, as an alternative. Okay, so if you, if you call me easy believism, I'll call you hard believism. But there is something that I would call, or I would fit under the label of easy believism that isn't the gospel, and that's the no, notion that a person prayed a prayer without understanding, even if they didn't understand, as long as they asked or prayed, then they're saved. No, it has to be with understanding. But. So, but it's a misnomer. It's a label. It's a label to. Um, I can't remember what the term. 
what the term of, of debating is, but basically you make your opponent look like an idiot. It's like mocking. Yeah, it's a, it's a label that you put on somebody to mock their position instead of dealing with the position. And it's a misnomer in that sense. It's mislabeled. Because I don't believe in easy believism. But, I, I mean, I, I shouldn't say that right. I believe that believing is easy. It's looking. If it was hard believism, no one would achieve it. And it's arrogant, the Paul Washer types, for instance, that think that they can believe enough. That's why the man struggles with depression. I don't mean to pick on him at a personal level. That's why he's under so much tension and so much pressure that he buckles. Because he believes in hard believism, and when he's honest about it, if that were actually true, he's not saved. And he, he doubts his salvation. He doesn't have assurance of salvation, I guarantee you. Hard believism. Hey, man.